I'll introduce my colleague, Bill Robinson, um, who's an MD, PhD at Stanford, an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine, um, and focuses on laboratory and translational um, studies in arthritis. Bill? Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pizzo and, and Dr. Genovese. And it's a pleasure to be able to present to you an overview of osteoarthritis and some of the thoughts about that disease in 2009. Um, I wanted to start with um, highlighting the problem, and this is a very typical case uh, that was uh, actually published in the JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, and this, this patient states, uh, my knee pain keeps me from being as active as I really want to be. I am a very, very active person. I'm 60 years old and I work full time. I have three kids and take care of the house and the yard, and I'm always having trouble uh, at the end of the day. And every, time, uh, and every time when I walk downstairs, I have to hold on to the side of the, ra of the walls to kind of hold my, my weight because I can't put all my weight on my knees. And this is uh, the typical symptoms of osteoarthritis, a degenerative arthritis that affects uh, many millions of Americans and causes significant um, a cost to both the individuals and to society. So osteoarthritis is the most common form of arthritis um, worldwide, as Mark mentioned. It uh, is manifest by progressive deterioration of the articular cartilage uh, covering the bone on joint surfaces. It involves the fingers, knees, hips, and spine. And it causes uh, pain and, and ultimately loss of mobility. And this is a schematic picture of the, the process in osteoarthritis with a normal joint on uh, the left side of the slide and an osteoarthritic joint on the right side. And you can see the breakdown of the articular cartilage as well as the formation of new bone growth, which are termed um, osteophytes. And based on the picture, you can kind of have the impression that this patient has an eff a small effusion in their joint. And if you tap that fluid, there's a low degrade of, grade of inflammation uh, in the joint fluid. These are x-rays of patients with end-stage osteoarthritis of both the knee on the left and the hip on the right. And you can see complete loss of the joint space uh, due to obliteration and breakdown of, of the cartilage. And in both of these cases, uh, patients require uh, joint replacement uh, surgery. This is the view of osteoarthritis from the arthroscope at the top. So normal cartilage in a knee through the arthroscope is very smooth and almost glossy. Whereas in osteoarthritis, you see fibrillination of the cartilage, cartilage with a friable appearance. And histologically, you see in osteoarthritis in, in normal cartilage, a full proteoglycan matrix with uh, chondrocytes uh, populating that, that proteoglycan matrix. And in osteoarthritis, you see breakdown of the cartilage with fibrillination, uh, and extensive loss of chondrocytes due to death and abnormal hypertrophy of the chondrocytes that are still uh, present. This uh, slide presents the epidemiology of osteoarthritis. Uh, in the top graph, the prevalence in humans greater than age 65, with approximately 90% uh, of humans greater than age 65 having uh, hand osteoarthritic changes, about a third having uh, osteoarthritis involving the knee, and 5% uh, involving osteoarthritis involving the hip uh, when you do a general survey based on radiographs. If, in terms of actually having symptoms from their osteoarthritis, uh, about 15% uh, of males and 25% of, of women over age 65 have symptomatic OA that affects the quality of their life, uh, causing difficulties in the activities of daily living. And there's obviously a tremendous economic burden to this degenerative arthritis with a cost to individuals and to society, and it's estimated that up to 2% of GMP from industrialized uh, nations is devoted or is lost as a result of osteoarthritis. So I just wanted to highlight a, what's known today about the pathogenesis of OA. Um, it's, like many uh, diseases, a polygenic disease, meaning many different genes uh, contribute. Uh, frequently, we think that antecedent trauma to a joint decades before leads to the development of degenerative arthritis. Joint instability is a very important factor, such as uh, having a ligament tear, like an ACL tear, that results in instability and chronic microtrauma that leads to the development of osteoarthritis. 
Inflammatory diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis or crystal driven arthritis like gout uh, cause damage to the cartilage that ultimately result in the development of osteoarthritis. And so, um, just in schematic form, uh, it's not completely understood uh, exactly why people develop OA, but it's a confluence of all these factors with uh, a genetic predisposition combined with expression of different degradative enzymes, certain inflammatory mediators uh, uh, that ultimately result in chondrocyte dysfunction and the breakdown of cartilage that manifests as, as osteoarthritis. So today, in 2009, there are no disease-modifying therapies for osteoarthritis. Our therapy is based primarily on pain control. We give patients acetaminophen, Tylenol, or non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, Motrin, ibuprofen. But none of these drugs alter the course of disease, and we're basically controlling pain in our patients. We also do physical therapy and other adjunct measures to try and maintain mobility. And ultimately, when the patient has uh, pain or inhibited mobility that's intolerable, they're referred to orthopedics for basically a joint replacement. So this is uh, the approach uh, that, or the experience of most patients with osteoarthritis with patient uh, years and lifetime represented on the x-axis and the severity of osteoarthritis on the y-axis. And we start off with adjunctive uh, therapies. Uh, Mark highlighted some of those, proceeding to pain control regimens with Tylenol or non steroidal anti-inflammatories. Ultimately, patients can receive certain intra-articular injections such as steroids or hyaluronic acid, although neither of those uh, alters the process or the progression of, of disease and only provides short-term um, pain relief. And once symptoms become so severe uh, that these uh, modalities don't provide sufficient relief, the patient undergoes a joint replacement. And uh, this is especially a problem for younger patients with osteoarthritis because the lifespan of a joint replacement is approximately 15 years and it's very difficult to uh, revise uh, joint replacements when they wear out. So I would predict that osteoarthritis will become the dominant clinical uh, problem in the rheumatology clinic in the decades uh, to come. And I believe that this is the case because osteoarthritis represents a common end-stage degenerative pathway that arises from essentially all inflammatory and non-inflammatory uh, joint insults. So whether you have rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, gout, or traumatic injury, all those converge upon the degenerative pathways that are osteoarthritis. And further, that with current immunomodulatory therapies, such as blocking TNF, as, as Dr. Genovese mentioned, and some of the other therapies, we can now start to control some of the autoimmune arthritis. Uh, while in contrast, there's no disease-modifying therapies currently available for osteoarthritis. So I just want to spend uh, just couple minutes highlighting one vignette of a recent finding from our laboratory that I think is very exciting, and that's the discovery that uh, the complement system may play a critical role in the development of osteoarthritis. And so we started by taking synovial fluid samples from patients with osteoarthritis, and we performed uh, large-scale mass spectro spectrometry analysis. And based on our hits, we observed a whole slew of complement proteins, both effectors and inhibitors, that were upregulated in expression in osteoarthritis synovial fluid. We do immunohistochemical analysis of joint tissue derived from osteoarthritis patients, and we see activation of complement C3 on the surface of the cartilage from OA, as well as deposition of the N-terminal complement components that actually punch holes in cells and, and, and destroy cells. And these are uh, surrounding chondrocytes and may be destroying the chondrocyte, the cartilage-producing cell in OA. We also analyzed a gene array analysis, so RNA expression in osteoarthritis in normal patients. And basically, we, we group the patients or in what's called clustering, bioinformatic clustering, and all the osteoarthritis patients are represented by the results in columns, and they group on the left here. Um, and basically, green is a decrease in expression, red is an increase, and you can see that all the osteoarthritis patients have increased expression in the red here of multiple different 
complement effector proteins. Whereas in contrast, synovial tissue derived from healthy normal individuals um, had increased expression of multiple complement inhibitors and a decreased or almost no expression of these complement effector proteins, suggesting that there's a fundamental dysregulation of the genetic program in the synovial tissue that's contributing to the osteoarthritic, uh, the pathogenesis of osteoarthritis. And just in the last couple slides, we wanted to, to further validate these findings. And so we perform what I term reverse translation, using an animal model to validate our genomic and proteomic finding in humans. And I'm just going to encapsulate the result in, in two or so slides here. Basically, that if you take wild type mice, so normal mice, and you surgically destabilize their joint, they develop severe bone on bone osteoarthritis. Whereas in contrast, if you take complement deficient mice, it, the complement deficiency protects their cartilage from degeneration and protects the mice against osteoarthritis. Uh, and further, we can show that the, there's a functional benefit to the mice if we protect them from osteoarthritis. So here's a time course in the severity of osteoarthritis on the y-axis. And you can see our wild-type mice develop severe osteoarthritis, while the complement deficient mice are protected as compared to wild-type. And we also perform functional analysis using a, a, basically a catwalk that gets videoed and then you analyze the gait patterns. And what we see is that uh, our wild type mice that develop osteoarthritis have progressive gait disturbance as noted by this, this dark blue uh, line here. Whereas uh, mice that were complement deficient and uh, were protected against osteoarthritis maintained a normal gait pattern uh, very consistent to that observed in normal mice. Finally, we show that uh, certain cartilage components, so when you develop osteoarthritis, the cartilage breaks down and becomes exposed and may release components. And we show one particular component, fibromodulin, directly activates the complement system. So the y-axis is activation of the complement system. And you can see fibromodulin that may be exposed and released when the cartilage breakdown activates the complement system, whereas other cartilage components that we tested did not. So in summary, osteoarthritis is a, the most common joint disease in the world that is characterized by the breakdown of the articular cartilage. Greater than a quarter of all humans over age 65 have symptomatic OA that, that uh, causes uh, joint pain and loss of mobility. And our current therapeutic strategy is basically based on pain control uh, and ultimately uh, joint replacement. And there's a tremendous clinical need for regenerative approaches to treat this, uh, these diseases or this disease. And further, based on the work in our laboratory, we've identified an unexpected and potentially critical role for the complement system in the pathogenesis of OA. And further, that therapeutically addressing this underlying inflammatory process may be critical for the ultimate success success of regenerative and stem cell therapies. And um, just to highlight a couple of the challenges for regenerative medicine at the very practical level. So regenerating cartilage, obviously it's on weight-bearing surfaces and that, propose, uh, that poses unique problems relative to regeneration of certain other organs and tissues. Um, there are unique properties of cartilage in that it's avascular as well as chondrocytes in that they're generally not a, a renewing population of cells. Uh, further, uh, it's essential that in regenerative therapies that a specific type of cartilage, hyaline cartilage, is regenerated and not fibrocartilage, uh, which is uh, much softer and doesn't hold up and can't uh, provide the type of, of function that, that uh, robust hyaline cartilage can. Uh, and finally, some very practical clinical development issues, the lack of validated clinical outcome measures, effectively based on the fact that nothing's been approved, so there's no, no pathway that's already been trodden, and less well-defined regulatory pathway arising from the same issue. And just the people in my lab who did this work, um, several fellows uh, drove uh, this work, and it was done in collaboration with Mark Genovese and David Lee at Harvard. Thank you very much. Thank you.